Yeah, so we, we will have skipped the previous one about Robert Boyd, but doesn't matter. This one uh, is titled Western Man Uses, Controls, and I should say, namely, Colonizes the Earth. Seeing the Earth as insentient and mechanical means that you, you humans can, are able to colonize it. Nature is no longer a life-giving mother, but the source of natural resources there for humans use in a production system for humans. The earth, nature has been robbed of its own purposes for existing, its sentience, and of course, its luminosity. It has become a mechanical object for humans' use or pleasure. Natural resources are inputs in the industrial mode of production. National parks were created in the 19th century in the US for the pleasure and elevation of tourists and not for use of natural resources. Its former inhabitants, the indigenous peoples of the Americas, having been forcibly expulsed from them. In indigenous peoples' worldviews, human beings are part of nature, relating to other earth beings as respected kin with whom one must reciprocate. We humans are only one earth being among a multitude of others. So here I'm arguing this is not an anthropogenic soil, but a cosmocentric one. The, the word anthropogenic literally means made or invented from genic by anthropos, humans. So it's a human made soil. That's what scholars call it because it's full as this archeological uh, cut shows. It's full of these little white dots are uh, broken ceramics. So they know it was made by humans. However, it's not made only by humans. It's made by humans and many other earth beings. Our Quechua indigenous collaborators explain where such ceramic fragments come from. Namely, they come from offerings to the spirits of the food field, the chakra. In the extensive scientific literature on this soil, there's no mention of offerings. This literature is thoroughly quantitative. If we fail to see ourselves as only one earth being among others and fail to reciprocate and respect the other beings, we will in the long run be back with the ecological crisis we now know. What follows is a five minute video of offerings to the spirits of the chakra by members of our center. Sustainability and ecologically friendly practices are not sufficient. How do I start this? Uh, okay, here. Pachamama, una caipuncha, nyuka, y aikuni, wayna kuna, aipi, chamuni pusha, tuki, we waikuna, aipenipa, asho mi kunamba, chairaiko, shuminimanda pacha, wasikipi, y aikuni. Todos, en esta mañana, estamos reunidos para pedir eh, permiso a nuestro, a nuestra Pachamama para ingresar. They are asking permission to enter the forest and to gather microorganisms, mycelia from the forest. Para mejorar eh, la producción, las cosechas. 
para increase eso, te pedimos permiso the harvest para and we ask Gracias. permission of you, Sachamama, to enter to enter you and collect the mycelia. Now we are collecting mycelia. Mycelia are microscopic mushrooms. These are leaf cutter ants. I thought they were cute. By the way, the, the, the cigarette is not a cigarette. It's called a mapacho. It's an indigenous uh, made cigarette because tobacco is the food of the spirit. Here she says, thank you. Thank you for, for bringing your, your children, the mycelia, and to return happily, all of us. <laughs> this, is it. this is a kid of one of our collaborators. Here are uh, offerings during, during planting. So first you blow smoke on the seeds. That's called ikarar, smudging. Here it's in a school. Invoking the sun. And other spirits. He's sharing chicha with the spirit and breaking the ceramic bowl. Thank you to the to to the water, to the rain, to the earth. Thank you for that we speak the same language us. of the earth and the sky and the water. I'm inspired and touched to be the kids a part of this tradition of their ancestors and sharing it with us. I hope that we continue to be inspired and to, to be taught by Mother Earth and that we continue to value what she offers us and we continue to be in relationship with her. This is one of the students in <laughs> one of the courses that I taught, that I used to teach here. She's a South Asian student from Canada. That's Landy here and Gregorio. So we give an offering to all the spirits and we, we thank the sun, the moon, the soil, the forest, the sea. And you plant with a digging stick. You make a hole and you put the, the seed in the hole. We do this offering at every harvest, at every planting. Because they give us life, they give us food. Oh no, how do I stop this one? Uh, let's see, stop video, here we go. And uh, next, there we go. 
So I want to end this presentation with uh, something that I learned from my online Guardian newspaper uh, a few days ago. And uh, it gave me hope. I call it glimmers of hope from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity of the United Nations. Something called the Das Gupta Review, they refer to, states the planet is at extreme risk by the failure of economics to take account of the true value of nature. Incorporating diverse worldviews and knowledge systems will be key. The review highlights four necessary perspectives. One, li oops, sorry, living from nature, living with nature, namely the right of non-human life to thrive. Three, living in nature, namely people's sense of place and identity. And four, living as nature, meaning treating the whole world as a spiritual part of being human. Two successful examples, the Canadian Nuclear Waste Management Organization has integrated indigenous perspectives in planning with decision makers participating in ceremonies and experiencing the land together. The Indian government's decision not to mine near the Nyamgiri mountain sacred to the Dongaria Khand peoples, the intrinsic value to indigenous people was seen as more valuable than the financial gains from mining it. This to me uh, was wonderful news because you just don't hear that, that from governments or international organizations. So I thought I would end uh, this presentation because a lot of it is, is fairly, uh, you know, critical. And I thought it would be nice to end on a positive note. Thank you very much. And if we have time left, I think we have about half an hour left. I would love to have your comments, questions, and so forth. So how do I stop my presentation, Janvi? Previous you last. Just, you just stop uh, sharing, Frederick. That should do it. Uh, stop sharing, okay. New share, stop sharing, pause share. I don't say, I just see pause share. You can also click on escape on your keyboard, which. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. Um, yeah, how do I get out of this? <laughs> you can also uh, click on next and click again, which will end the uh, full screen of the, which will end the slideshow. Okay. At the, at the very end of that thing, it says end show. See, yeah. the first is next, right? At the very bottom says end show. Okay, let me see. Yeah. Keep, look at the oh, very bottom of that. Slides, show, screen, start, keep slide. And show, great, oops. Here we go. Oh, I didn't do it. <laughs> you, you, go and uh, see if you can click on it. I did, but it didn't end it. Yeah, new comment. Now I can't get that thing anymore. Uh, there. Well, <laughs> Here, it's done. I did it, yeah. <clears throat> Is that good? But Yes, uh, yes. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Frederic. Um, I'm, I'm Peter Milan. I'm actually here in Peru at the moment also. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can, oh, here, yeah, I can see you. Yes. Yeah, Hi. yeah. So I'm actually also here in Peru at the moment. I've just finished um, three medicine ceremonies with the shamans here outside of Cusco in the Andes. Um, and I have a company um, where we're actually working with cities and governments 
to apply a regenerative uh, frameworks to developing new ways of actually working with whole cities and communities um, in a way that reflects also um, a lot of the indigenous principles, um, but using um, kind of a regenerative methodology in order to shift mindset away from the mechanistic extractive mindset into something that's based on beneficial mutualism. And so yes. we're doing that with cities and we're also doing that with, um, with large whom? corporations. With Where cities. did you say we're cities? working with cities, cities. Yeah, whole cities. Cities. Yeah. and we're also working with large corporations and also the Bankers Association in Liechtenstein, where we're looking to design a new regenerative framework for finance so that we can move capital into the essential areas that are going to help do this deep regenerative work that needs to actually happen. So Wonderful. I just wanted to, to let you know that there are folks out there working to uh, bring regenerative methodologies into kind of the, the larger uh, areas that are typically extractive. And what is your name? My name is Peter, Peter Milan. I'm the founder of a company called Jet Group and we're, we're the ones that are doing this work globally at the moment. So Wonderful. we have a project in Saudi Arabia. We're in discussions with some, some governors in the US, um, also in the UK um, and, and South Africa as well. So thank you for sharing that because I think bringing those uh, indigenous insights is very important to all of the work that we're doing because we, we need to get back to source. Yeah, great. Congratulations, yeah. this is wonderful. Yes, Frederick, of course. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen. <clears throat> Where are you in Peru? Women first. <laughs> No, no, go ahead, Neela, go ahead. Yeah, of course, you know, I, I've known your work, but every time you present this, you know, the immediacy and the need for this is extraordinary. I also found the, you know, the difference between the anima mundi image of the woman not at the center uh, versus the anthropocentric. Uh, it, it's so, you know, uh, extraordinary even though the understanding uh, of the total uh, anima mundi world as a uh, gynocentric to use my whatever terminology, but it is not about the, you know, centered that, that means that almost like a, so that was something very important to point out that this particular worldview that all the world's ancient traditions um, actually, you know, uh, almost intuitively understood, uh, which was replaced by the mechanized Makina Mundi. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you once again for the incredible work you've been doing. Thank you, Nila. Thank you very much. Well, Your I, I, work has been I, very I, important to me as well. <laughs> Who is this? Hi, my name is Stephen Badger. I, I, uh, I, I today had the good fortune to. Disappeared. Can you see me? Hear me? Hello? Can you see me? Hear me? I can hear you, but not see you. Oh, well, that's I can, I can I, hear you, but not see you. No I can worries. see you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, no loss for those who can't, uh, but uh, thank you indeed for the presentation. Lovely to see your work, more than lovely, um, very, very inspirational and very important in, in recrafting uh, our way back to, to what is, so to speak, uh, the truth, uh, I would say in the small T, capital T. And um, uh, I had the good fortune of seeing Nilima today. I'm in Mumbai, so I ate lunch with her. Oh, oh how and, wonderful. <laughs> and she, yes, and so uh, I'm working with her on a film around her Shakti leadership and, and so forth. And so uh, I had not, was not aware of her truth and re reconciliation work of which this is a part. And, uh, and so super to be here and thank you for your work. I had heard of biochar in the Amazon before and, and PETA, I don't know if you're working with hemp, but uh, I, I have a dear friend who's in hemp at scale, at industrial uh, scale levels of hemp with uh, the creation of biochar from the fiber uh, of hemp. And 
if that's of interest, I can uh, put my contact info in the um, in the chat if you have any interest in following up on that. Well, I think we should share contact info anyway, because the way in which we work is when we're working with cities is we work with the city leaders, but then we also work with civil society and corporations at the same time. And we facilitate a shift um, through workshops and different things um, so that we're working with place-based potential, right? Every place has its own unique potential, has its own ecology, has its own um, history and cultures and things like this. So we work to unlock the unique place-based potential. So one solution, like if hemp is a good solution in a particular area, it may not be a good solution in another, do you know what I mean? So we try to work really with um, very um, understanding the potential unique to each place. But, so, but it's really good to have those contacts for sure. Yeah. Just let me say hi. This is Maria Lang from the Netherlands. And I'm just following your presentation and this discussion because I'm so much intrigued by what you are sharing. And I don't know what it has to do with what I'm doing, but I do know that I'm a really uh, a good friend of Niliman. I followed the Shakti leadership uh, course that she developed. So it's good to hear that's going to be filmed. So it should be uh, more known and well spread in the world. And the other thing is that I'm really intrigued by this regenerative agriculture. And I just happened to organize a big event at Terra Mera, which is of uh, Irena Atoyevich. She just left, I think she left our room. She was here, she was listening uh, to you, but she has this beautiful place in Croatia where she's also working with the local people and regenerating the fields and restarting the, well, the, the, the ethnic or the historic way of uh, producing and I, I just decided to celebrate my birthday there. I thought that's also a contribution. <laughs> so Nilima was there. We had this huge party with more than 60 people from all around the world. And this was also an inspiration to connect all these beautiful local initiatives. And at the same time, we are all global people knowing how to connect. So in one way or another, I feel there is, you have all these beautiful local initiatives, but it's so beautiful that we know and we can share among each other all this knowledge, all this historic knowledge, all this new knowledge. And yeah, there's something very beautiful about it. So that's why I really want to listen in and share this. Wonderful, wonderful, Marjolaine. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. So it's so beautiful that you are doing all these initiatives and some other people are enjoying or sharing and this is what it's all about. That it's not among all the, the people who are really doing the true work, but it's also about sharing the work. So maybe like Stephen is doing. Yes. Thank you. From your perspective, Frederick, do you think we're on a breakthrough of recognizing the anima or, uh, or is it, do you think we're on the cusp of a breakthrough or do you think we're still some ways to go from your own perspective at, at any kind of global scale? Well, uh, I think we have the, hopefully we are at the beginning, uh, but it's going to take time and probably conflict as well uh, because the entrenched the entrenched interests are so powerful and so entrenched uh, i mean i am just stunned that this knowledge about this soil has been around now for a good uh, I, I want to say 30 years at least 
probably more. Uh, and uh, the majority of I mean, things are changing. Uh, I follow it more closely in the US. Uh, they're changing, but marginally, marginally. The government still uh, gives money to large industrial farmers. They help them. So they are addicted to this. They can't get out. <laughs> and, uh, and they have a lot of power. I mean, it's like coal industry, or all these industries, bad industries. They, they have a lot of power, political power, because they pay. They give money to the politicians. But the knowledge uh, is out. There are many uh, all over the world. Uh, but they're always small uh, experiments. I don't know, Peter, if that uh, yeah. work, you, you see some change. Yeah, so what I want to say about that is that um, large corporations, CEOs, and, and these folks that are doing a lot of the lobbying, they're just scared, right? They don't know how to make this transition without losing... Um, without failing to meet their fiduciary responsibilities to their shareholders, right? So we're working with them to try to show them a safe way, and that's what we're calling the regenerative transition, is a safe way in order to bring about this deeper transformation in a way that enables them to unlock value multiples that they, they can't even imagine right now, right? Because they're thinking from this very mechanistic, siloed, linear way of thinking. So when we can work with them in a very developmental way that enables them to see how they can actually unlock value multiples and it's going to enact, actually enable them to do create more value rather than the, the fear that they have right now, which is that they're going to lose, then we can try to take a lot of the fear out of the transition. Because when people are scared of loss, their energy contracts. And you, you would know this, Frederick, right? So what we're trying to do is to work with them in such ways they can feel safe and they can become expansive. And that's why it's more than a behavior shift. It has to be a fundamental mindset shift. And, and you would have experienced this also with, with doing the medicine ceremonies and the, the deep healing that ayahuasca and different types of traditional things can bring about. And we're working to do that with them at that level so that they can see, well, actually, we can do an energy transition and it can actually be not just about an energy transition, but unlocking the potential of our community. Right. And, yes. and creating deep healing for our community and, and these types of things. So we're trying to really de-risk and take the fear out of the conversation. Bless your soul, Peter. <laughs> yes, yes, I, indeed. You know, I just, that's totally out of my range. I was an academic for most of my life, and now, you know, all my energy and time is spent in this center and writing. <laughs> and to engage at this level is totally beyond my, my ability. So I bless you for doing this. It's wonderful. Yeah. And we're and seeing love, some. I'd love industry. to be in. Yeah, for sure. I'd, I'd love, love to, to learn be in contact you. with you. You should yes. send and me, me too. my email. Yeah, yes, and me email. too. I want to learn more from you and your soil scientists and things like this because we're finding government. So Saudi Arabia wants to divest away from oil and gas, and so they're putting a lot of energy into tourism. And with that, they're wanting to trial some new things. So we're doing a regenerative tourism pilot with them in Taif, right, which is also about deep community healing, yeah. having the community move away from extremist ideas of Islam, which is not really in line with the original kind of philosophy of Islam, you know? And so there's a deep shift that has to happen. It's not just the building of a new industry. Canada is also looking at regenerative tourism pilots. Liechtenstein, which is one of the wealthiest countries in the world and holds some of the, the highest amounts of private wealth is looking at how to move beyond sustainable finance into a regenerative finance um, methodology. What, what could that look like? What could finance look like if it were to support the thriving of all of life? So we're starting to see now some of these conversations at those top levels being had and folks really struggling to kind of 
comprehend what the change could look like, but we're working with them as their partners to kind of like shepherd in that transition. So I, I would love to learn more from you, Frederic, and, and from your soil scientists that you work with at the different universities as well. And, and I need, um, and, yeah. And I need to hear you talk about these things. It gives me incredible hope. <laughs> Yeah. It's wonderful you're doing this. Um, Peter, you might, my you, you, might, you, might be, you might be interested as well as everybody else in a, a speaking of, of what you are uh, building on that, um, which it's, it's wonderful indeed what you're doing is an organization called the Economics of Mutuality, uh, which you could find online. It's, it's a spin out from the corporation Mars um, and the principle of mutuality being one of their principles. And uh, the, the work began trying to, quanti to, to see if one could quantify um, quantitatively, not just qualitatively, what mutuality would look like between a business and its stakeholders, so to speak. And uh, it's spun out now into a foundation, which is focused on uh, ongoing research and academia with the likes of Said Business School being the lead partner where they're now teaching uh, their graduate students about mutuality. Uh, yeah. And got a business as well, which funds the foundation. All the profits from the business go into the foundation, which hangs a shingle and will engage with corp corporates or others to, to teach them how to bring that to life. But, but that might, might be of interest to you and um, worry. Yeah, and it's in, it's in line on what we're doing because we've built an application, Stephen, called Community. And what it does is it like it measures the nested systems impact of initiatives or investments in a way that we can track the, the beneficial um, relationships or the mutualistic relationships from quick wins to midterm and then changes to a system over time. And we're also building into that, just starting to build into that too, tracking of like impacts on fossil fuels of these regenerative initiatives. And we're actually doing a, a series A round, a, a fundraising round, because we're gonna turn this into a metaverse. So if you can imagine having a metaverse of say Toronto, for instance, and then all of the regenerative initiatives that are happening within that localized space, all of the participants, civil society, corporations, whatever, they can actually see the value add that they're having uh, across the system over time from their participation in these initiatives, right? And then what we're able to see then is a move beyond ESG and all these stuff, which is a total financial abstraction and it's not related to real on the ground impact. So we're starting to build out a way to visualize the world in a virtual world in a way that mirrors it so that we can start to see our real value add, our real value impacts and how that impacts over a system over time, right? And we're starting to explore how we can do this also in the context of tourism. So imagine you go on a holiday to, um, to, to your, your site, Frederic, right? And maybe some people who come to visit you participate in the development of parts of reforestation of your area, right? They can see their impact that they've had through this application um in your part of the world and then as they travel they see all the value that they start to generate around the world and so it's it's intended to empower people right because we feel like this thing is too big for us we're just what am i going to do i'm one person but if you can visualize the impact that you're having you can quantify it and you can see how it intersects with impact that other people are having then maybe you can give enough hope and momentum to folks to actually make a fundamental uh, difference on the planet. So this concept that you're talking about, economic mutualism, yeah. Stephen, very, very relevant. I'm very interested in that because we're, we're doing a lot of building around that to ourselves. Yeah. Super, super. Yes. And if, I, if, I keep if, putting typos in all of my email addresses in the chat. Ignore those last two. I'm going to type really slow. <laughs> so as not to make any typos. I can't type and listen to you guys at the same time without making mistakes. I'm the worst multitasker on the planet. There you go. That last one's correct. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, Peter. Peter at jet.io. Dot io. Yeah. <laughs> what does IO stand for? Oh, it's just a it's just a domain that's normally characteristic of um, technology what? companies. I said it's a domain that's normally characteristic of technology companies. And because Do you have we, a website? And, Do you have a website, Peter? Yes, yes. Oh, so okay. if you go to if you go to that, it's just a landing page at the moment. It's the same domain. There you go. Um, so, so we're a hybrid company. We do this field services with the communities and the governments, and then we have the technology elements that enable people to really like um, uh, support the development and the transitions. Bless your soul. I don't know if you can hear me, Peter, but yeah, bless your soul. Bless your soul for your work. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we need to develop a new economic model. That's what it needs to be Absolutely. about in order to support the Absolutely. thriving of life, right? Absolutely. Because the whole, the whole basis of Bacon's work and Descartes' work and, and then the post-industrialists is about, you know, bring, how do we bring people out of poverty without actually continuing this extractive way of living exactly exactly and i think that's why the sdgs alone don't really serve us i mean it serves us in terms of having us think about things that are important but if we're still coming from an extractive paradigm our solutions are still going to just keep confounding the problems right exactly exactly so my question is how do we bring about this paradigm shift that needs to happen in our thinking and have a, an economic model that reflects that. Because I think that's the only way that I can come up with in, in my own limited view about how we can make this fundamental transition at scale in a way where it's not just these small pockets yeah. um, that you were talking about, Frederic, of experiments and, and really visionary people doing small things around the planet. We need to create a bigger kind of shift. Yeah, I think I think you'll find the um, and I'll I'll put you I'll just take the lead and put you in touch with the uh, the leader of uh, of EOM. Uh, I think you you'll find it interesting. Um, all of you might find it interesting, but especially um, in your day to day work, Peter, because the whole point of it is uh, how do you actually, as you say, put into practice a new business model? What what does that look like? I mean, what does triple bottom line accounting look like? To go you know way back in time to that theory, and and vernacular. Um, but actually, how do you do that? And that's what this is designed to do, is to actually yeah. help business figure out how to generate value, as you say, across a multiplicity of fronts uh, in, a, in a way that is meaningful to a business, as opposed to just being a CSR or ESG endeavor, for example, but actually is relevant to your business. So is, in fact, generating greater value across uh, while also addressing uh, the stakeholder issues that exist for any given business. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, I've done a lot of presentations on triple bottom line, even at the World Economic Forum and things. And I think part of the challenges with those things is it's still coming from a very cost-based view. It's like we're looking at risk mitigation or we're looking at crisis mitigation. We're not actually looking at what is the inherent potential that we have as humans or that we have as a natural system and how can we work to unlock that potential? So everything's coming from this very kind of contracted view at the moment of risk, um, mitigation, adaptation, cost, you know, rather than shifting to, well, actually, there's this, all this potential. Nature has a huge amount of potential and we're part of that living system. So who do we need to be or how do we need to shift in order to unlock it? One way or another, it's also necessary to, um, how do you say, to connect to the customers. So it's not only the business, but also 
the ordinary people who want to be connected to or who want to feel or hear this story. So I'm also wondering, what can I do as a normal human being, <laughs> but feeling there is something to be done? Except from connecting people, sharing about it, maybe making movies, um, staying trustful. What? That's a good question. And I think I think that the, 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 the opportunity for us is to look at ourselves first, right? We have to work three lines of work at the same time, the self, the group, and the system. And we can't bring anything fundamentally transformational to the planet until we're unlocking that transformational capacity in ourselves. And so a deeper inquiry into what lights you up, what's your purpose, how do you see the best, mm. most healthy expression of yourself, yeah. and then you'll find your way in that. It will become a unique expression of, of yourself in the world. And that's how you're going to have the biggest impact. Exactly. We, we tend to think very functionally about what we do, how we do things different instead of who we're being. Yeah, 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 true. But it's also about connecting all these initiatives eh? so that if you know that these beautiful initiatives are happening, then it lights up the fire. If I see what's happening between you already, it's so beautiful. So that's thanks to Nilima and all the other people who connected us. Right, right. It's very hopeful because yeah, when what we see young people taking on because different people have different tasks, right? But individuals, I've also found uh, in my classes uh, how simply making young people aware of what it immediately does light up uh, and they re recognize that their future, their lives, it all depends on not on the bottom line that's been given to them. Uh, so information sharing is vital. And I think individual choices uh, with our you know, uh, wallets, what we buy, what we reject, and voting, I mean, what is going on in the United States right now is like, this can be very scary, but at the same time, all the small initiatives are going to have an impact. And there are many, many of them. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this Ubiquity University's Humanity Rising Initiative. Uh, they have been having this incredible dialogue and across the board. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful. <laughs> that uh, if we could create what we have created, we can also you know, move to this uh, moving to regenerative and economics and ways of life. Uh, so thank you for this wonderful dialogue together. Thank you indeed. Yeah. Thank you. You're muted, Frederick. Uh, yes, we have reached 10.30 and I want to say thank you to all of you. It's been wonderful hearing you and thank you for coming to my session. Uh, I am these days quite busy here at Such a Mama uh, and I'm going back to this work right now. Uh, having been uh, given by some of you and many of you a boost of hopefulness. So thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye. Bye.